Thank you. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to speak extempore for a few minutes now just to sort of set the scene for the paper a little. And then I will read most of the paper, although I probably won't read every citation that you have on the handout that, that Connor has given you, and then conclude and, as Paul says, there'll be a break for coffee and then questions afterwards. First of all, uh, there are two Scotuses in medieval philosophy. Uh, there is John Scotus, famous 14th century philosopher associated with the theory of the university of being, and then there is a lesser known Scotus who actually is Irish as opposed to Duns, who has finally been acknowledged to be Scottish. Um, Johannes Scotus Eriudrina, an 8th century Irish philosopher. He was, just to introduce him briefly, he was part of that great wave of Irish monks and scholars who went to the continent in, from about the 6th century, pretty much all the way through to the Reformation, but the, the, the golden age, so to speak, is the early Middle Ages, let's say from the 6th to the 10th centuries. Um, and what characterised, one of the things that characterised this particular group of scholars was an interest in the sacred languages. Uh, of course, Ireland was not Latin speaking, nor was it Greek speaking, unlike the rest of the church um, at that particular point in history. So they had to learn Latin and in order to access anything. And they also then had a tremendous interest in Greek because of course that was the original language of the New Testament and an interest in Hebrew. Um, they're about the only group in the Western church in the early Middle Ages who have like an, an interest in Hebrew. They don't get very far with it because the, the instruments for serious study, dictionaries, grammars, and so forth, don't really exist, at least not for learning uh, certainly Greek or Hebrew as, if you like, a second language. Um, but one person who did get a considerable distance was in fact Eriudrina. Um, how he learned his Greek, nobody knows. Um, there are various theories, uh, whether it was even all that good is, is another question, but certainly he learnt enough to produce a philosophically very interesting and very coherent and cogent translation of certain important Byzantine works, notably a writer thought to have been St. Paul's convert, uh, Dionysius, if you remember when St. Paul spoke to the assembled Athenians on the Areopagus, uh, there was one man, a Dionysius, who came up to him afterwards, and he was the only one in the Areopagus, who said, uh, I would like to know more about this. Now, in the sixth century, a group of writings began to circulate, attributed to Dionysius. They're actually philosophical writings dating from about the, dating, they're, they're, they're Syrian writings, in fact, sorry, 600, 7th century they began to circulate. They, uh, they're Syrian writings. Um, they bear the imprint of a philosopher called Proclus. Um, so, in fact, what you have with these writings is a very strong dose of very sophisticated and neoplatonic kind of late development of Plato's philosophy. And Christianized, um, so you know they're, they're, they're rendered Christian uh, by this unknown Syrian writer. But as I say, they were attributed to Dionysius the Areopagite, so they enjoyed great prestige initially in the Greek Church, and then in 842, the Byzantine Emperor sent a copy of these works in Greek to the Western Emperor um, Louis. And Louis, of course, realized, he spoke Greek himself, but he realized that you know, if these things were to have any impact in the Western Church, they would have to be translated. The initial translation translated the words, so to speak, but not the meaning. So 30 years later, um, Charles the Bold, at that point, the Western Emperor, 
set this Irishman, Erudrina, to translate Pseudo Dionysius. Now, the impact of Pseudo Dionysius on Erudrina's own thought was phenomenal, um, like it transformed it completely. This was something different from the predominant theological paradigm in the West at the time, which was Augustinian. Augustine, of course, is a notable philosopher in his own right, but there are things in Pseudo Dionysius which are not in Augustine or which are different from Augustine. And subsequently, Erudrina, in order to help himself with his work on Pseudo Dionysius, acquired a set of writings from a theologian known as Maximus the Confessor. Maximus is a hugely important figure in the church as a whole. Now, I don't want to go into the details of Maximus' biography, but um, in a sense, it's largely thanks to Maximus' confessor that the Catholic understanding of the incarnation is what it is. Um, that Christ is one person in two natures, um, that he had two wills, that he was fully human and fully divine. In the works of Maximus, following, of course, a long, long period of controversy and clarification, we find this clarified. So Maximus then, a very important figure in the Catholic world as a whole, but with a very different way of writing from contemporary Latin theologians of the same era. Um, Maximus, of course, is a Greek, immersed in the Greek world. There's a question as to whether or not he encountered Augustine because of his emphasis on uh, the whole question of will. Um, clearly, he knew Augustine. Um, how much influence did Augustine have? You know, it's, it's an ongoing debate. But with Maximus, we have somebody immersed in his own Eastern Greek Byzantine tradition but who also understands and uses Latin elements. Now, when Erudrina encountered Maximus, he knew he had encountered something extremely important. And he attempted, he, he did translate Maximus, but in his own theological and philosophical work, there are some, the important works of Erudrina are firstly the Periphysion, uh, which is called which is the Greek word meaning of natures. Um, so this is, this is Erudrina's theory of everything, so to speak, the periphysion, it's his cosmology. Um, we also have a commentary on the Gospel of St. John, and then a lovely work which Connor has excerpted in Contemplata, um, the homily on the prologue to the Gospel of St. John, which is like a little sort of epitome of um, his, his works as a whole. In his own work, what Erudrina attempted to do, and this is why I talk about breathing with both lungs, what he attempted to do was synthesize the Eastern and the Western traditions of theology. Um, well, philosophy and theology, but this is, if you like, a, a theology that has a very, very strong philosophical component and a philosophy that sees Christian theology as its ultimate and logical outcome. So they're, they're not distinguished as they were to become later on at that time. They're not analysed in that way. Um, now, when I talk about breathing with both lungs, what do I mean? I mean, I, it's a reference clearly to John Paul's assertion that the church must, once again, breathe with both lungs. That the Latin theological tradition has, in many respects, developed independently of the Greek tradition and, and vice versa. Um, in some ways, perhaps it's more true for the Latin tradition because, of course, the great era in, in Latin philosophy and theology is the 13th century, 13th and 14th centuries. And at that point, a sort of an actual living exchange between the two traditions really had ceased to exist. Um, this is simply, by the way, it's, it's not worked in, in any sort of coherent way, but. I think that many of the issues which Aquinas subsequently develops in the 13th century and which do challenge Augustine's position on certain issues in, in significant ways are recapitulations in a very different idiom and without any influence. I'm not arguing for influence. I'm simply saying that it is the case 
that I think, in a very different idiom, Aquinas picks up um, on themes that Erudina is attempting to, to deal with um, in his work. There are problems with some of what Augustine has to say, and um, Erudina attempts to confront them, and then Aquinas, developing a more satisfactory idiom to, to tell the truth, um, deals with them better in the 13th century. Now, what I want to do here is I want to go through as, as, as quickly as is humanly possible um, the, so to speak, fundamentals of, of Maximus' confessor's thought. Erudina knew two works of Maximus. He knew the ambigua. Ambigua is a sort of a disputed question. So he knew what we might call the disputed questions to John, the ambigua ad Ioannum. And he also knew um, a set of, again, disputed questions addressed to the deacon Thalassius. Um, now, it's interesting, significant that he knew these two works, because these are the two uh, sets of works where Maximus philosophy is actually at its strongest. Um, in other works of Maximus, we find you know, more asceticism, we find more development of monastic theology, but we find strong philosophical theology in these two works. Um, so that's what I want to look at to begin with. Then I want to look at how Erudina attempts to assimilate this into the Western tradition. And then finally, and in some ways this is, this is a significant part of the paper, I want to look at what became of Erudina's attempts to assimilate this thought. Uh, I mean, some of you will know that at, until the index was finally abolished, Erudina's work was on it. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, the origin of species, with all of the fuss that there was about Darwin, was never on the index, but Erudina never got off it. Um, so, you know, why did this happen? Um, if, you know, if what he was attempting to do was assimilate Greek thought, Byzantine theology, which is Catholic theology, albeit in a different idiom, different language, how come he ended up on the index? So I just want to have a look at that question. Um, and then, as I say, you know, I'll conclude. So Maximus the Confessor then, at the heart of Maximus the Confessor's contribution to Christian theology lies, as I was saying, his theology of the incarnation. And this is inseparable from his anthropology, like his theory of man. Philosophically, theologically, and indeed historically, in terms of the controversies of the time, Maximus' work is focused on God made man, what it means to say that God was made man, and what it means for human nature that God took it on. Everything else in Maximus' thought must be understood in relation to this crucial theme of the incarnation. So if Maximus is saying something about, you know, how much a monk should eat during Lent, it ultimately goes back to something relating to the incarnation. His thought is integrated in that very strong way. Um, above all, Maximus' teleology, that is to say his doctrine of the ultimate goal of man, of deification, or in Greek, theosis, is inseparable from his Christology. The ultimate goal of man is inseparable from who Christ was, what Christ did, what it means. When we come to Maximus' great Western admirer, the Irish philosopher, 8th century Irish philosopher, Johannes Scotus Eugena, henceforth Eugena, we find in some ways a different set of priorities in spite of his massive enthusiasm for Maximus. He did have access to a limited selection of texts, as I mentioned. Um, but that's not the only reason why his priorities are rather different. His interests are primarily metaphysical and philosophical. Um, of course, it's a metaphysics deeply influenced by Maximus. And indeed, the hermeneutical key to Arutina's work, I would argue, is, is Christological. In some ways, a rather odd Christology, but that's what it is. However, he does tend to reduce Christian thought to a system of metaphysics. 
And I think this is a live issue, actually, in, in, in some contemporary occurrence of, of Christian theology. It's, it's one we have to be able to deal with. Maximus, on the other hand, uses metaphysics in the service of theology, which is what makes him fundamentally orthodox and, and fundamentally more reliable than Erugina. Really, though, we're dealing with a difference of emphasis because it is a fundamentally Christian take, if you like, on metaphysics. Um, Erugina is interested in all structures of reality. He has strong scientific and medical interests, for example. Maximus really cuts straight to the theological essential all the time. The creation of man in the image and likeness of God. Now, this word likeness actually is an interesting one because it's dynamic. It's an ongoing sort of reformation uh, in uh, the likeness of God. This likeness is frustrated by the fall and redeemed in the person of Christ. Now, for Erugina, the sort of philosophical structures that, if you like, underpin theology, um, so this idea that sort of God goes out into creation and then draws creation back into himself, this is always going to be more to the forefront than is the case with Maximus. Um, with Maximus, yes, we have the same structure, but um, he transforms it into a theology of reciprocity. So God becomes man so that man may be divinized, may be taken into God. But Maximus' understanding of causality um, is an important element in his anthropology, in his theory of man. Um, however, this structure of you know, God proceeding into creation and creation being drawn back into God is heavily modified in Maximus by the importance that he attaches to human will and freedom. So in other words, man ought to be drawn back into God, but it's always possible for man, by his own kind of perverse choice, to, to frustrate that. Um, man always has the option of saying, no, I stay here, I go back, I don't uh, return to God. Um, now, Maximus, uh, this is in the second passage on your handout. Um, Maximus lays out here the fundamental metaphysical, ontological structure of reality. As in the Gospel of St. John, we see in the beginning was the Logos, in the beginning was the Word, and through him all things were made, and without him was not made anything that was made. The things that are made through the Logos have a very definite pattern and structure, uh, an individual pattern, and Maximus will tell us later, this includes their coming to be in time also. Um, so, in a sense, there are four dimensions, you know, there, there, there is the creature in its, its being, but its sort of existence through time is part of its being as well. And this appreciation of the importance of time is something that comes into the Western tradition very much later um, than in Maximus. Um, their existence, the existence of thing, the things that exist in time is part of their individual the blueprint, uh, or what Maximus calls, with a little l, their individual logos. Now, these individual blueprints are present from infinity, so to speak, as going to be at some point in time in the mind of God. And even as they come into existence, the, if, if, if you like, the divine conception of them remains within the divine. So Maximus then has this, you know, you do find the sense that, well, you know, a thing exists and is separate from God, and yet God willed it, intended it, intended it in a certain way, and that is something that always sort of remains with God. Um, so Maximus then, especially in this passage here, emphasizes that what he calls procession, that is, coming to be in external reality, this does not affect the integrity of the Godhead. So, you know, when God sort of conceives of a being, 
and then it comes into existence. He sort of doesn't lose anything. It, it doesn't sort of go out of him and, and you know, diminish him in some way. He remains always who he is. So the Logoi then, the, the individual blueprints of things, remain with God. This also, incidentally, relates to the conception of being that we find in this thinking, which is very different from the later Thomistic conception of being. With Thomas, we have this idea that being is um, uh, equivocal, uh, not equivocal, um, analogous. Um, God is being absolutely, um, and the things that exist are contingent. They depend on God. But in this tradition, the terminology of being is univocal. Being is creaturely being. Being is divided and multiple and always in motion. Being exists in time. This is why there's this emphasis on time. Um, so being then is creaturely being. The analogous term, in, you need an analogous term if you're going to talk about God and creation because they are related, um, but they're not the same. Uh, one depends on the other. You do need an analogous term. The analogous term in this way of thinking is actually God. You know, when they talk about God unfolding himself in creation, they don't mean to be pantheists, but what they're looking for is an analogous way of talking. Um, so man then constantly strives towards God. Um, his pattern is in God and his desire to fulfill himself is a desire to return to, so to speak, his own, his own cause, his own idea in God. This is how he was created. And the need to return to God is not purely soteriological. It's not simply a matter of being redeemed from sin or a need to escape from a state of sin. It's not simply a matter of being in what Augustine calls the regio de similitudinis. It's actually inherent in, in man's very creation. Um, man will always want to get closer and closer and closer to God. And of course, God is infinite. So this, this is an unending process. We find this developed in Gregory of Nyssa. Um, man's desire to get, as, as it were, to, to come as close to God as is possible is a dynamic process and it's an unending dynamic. Uh, the fall, so to speak, adds another dimension. It adds an element of separation um, which has to be overcome. Um, but it isn't the fall that makes man's relation to God dynamic. It was always intended that way, according to Maximus. Now, Maximus tells us that man was created both body and soul. Uh, this is the next uh, passage on your handout. The body is essential to his nature. Um, he tells us that out of God's great goodness, the human being was composed of a soul and a body. The rational and intellectual soul given to man is made in the image of its maker, and through desire and intense love, it holds fast to God and participates in the divine life. The soul becomes godlike through divinization, and because God cares for what is lower, that is, the body, and has given the command to love one's neighbor, the soul prudently makes use of the body. By practicing the virtues, the body gains familiarity with God and becomes a fellow servant with the soul. God, who dwells in the soul, uses it as an instrument to relate to the body and through the intimate bond between body and soul makes it possible for the body to share in the gift of immortality. The, the result is that what God is to the soul, the soul becomes to the body and the one God, creator of all, is shown to reside proportionately in all beings through human nature. So, you know, this notion of proportion of analogy is, is present here, but as I say, very differently from the way um, it will later be developed by Aquinas. Things that are by nature separated from one another return to a unity as they converge together in the one human being. When this happens, God will be all in all, permeating all things and at the same time, giving independent existence to all things in himself. In God's purpose, this is the end towards which our lives are directed. For this end, man was brought into the world. Maximus here, well, among other things, he's answering those who maintain that the body was a punishment uh, 
for the soul. I mean, there was a stream of thought that maintained, essentially agnostic, that maintained man was originally created simply as a soul, and um, that the body then was a punishment for the disobedience of the fall. Um, Maximus says, no, I mean, a human being as such was always meant to be body and soul. Um, this related to the Gnostic conception of matter as inherently evil. For Maximus, the existence of matter is neither good nor bad in itself. For example, in the first of these disputed questions to Thalassian, he explains how material passions can be turned to good purpose. Evil, and this is you know, Maximus thinking on will, evil comes from misdirection, from preferring something else to God. It's the fruit, in other words, of a perverted will. What he calls philautia, self-love, gives to the self, it arrogates to oneself what ought to be given to God. Um, so, for example, Adam and Eve want to be gods rather themselves, rather than worship God. So, as it exists now, the body is not as God intended it, but he did always intend a body. Now, in the original scheme of creation, man was to be the central point of all creation. Um, and again, this is the next passage on your handout. Man is essentially a composite of body and soul. Insofar as he is soul, he is akin to the angels, so he's a spiritual being, and capable of knowing God intellectually. Insofar as he is body, he is akin to the lower creatures, animate and indeed inanimate. By virtue of the fact that this composite unity can, by choosing a life of virtue, know and worship God as a whole, all created nature is ennobled. So man, so to speak, has the capacity to bring, I mean, this is why in, in certain circles, certain kinds of theology become fashionable with ecologists. Um, man has the capacity through his sort of kinship with nature by means of his body to ennoble creation. It's, it's a little like what Heidegger says when he talks about the hu humanity as that which speaks being. Um, because humanity has intellect, because it can know and understand creation, because it can relate creation to God, therefore creation is ennobled and brought to God uh, through uh, the human being. Um, things that are by nature separated from one another return to a unity as they converge together in the one human being. The one God, creator of all, is shown to reside proportionately, you could say analogously, in all beings through human nature, in which he is manifested in a particular way. Through man, nature, so to speak, so to speak, can worship God, and the ultimate unity of man with God unifies nature with him also. So, you know, you have this kind of symphonic view of the relationship between God and creation. I mean, they remain separate, they remain what they are, they retain their identity, um, but, but they, they, they are unified in the way that, you know, the different parts of an orchestra are unified and yet separate and retain separate identity. Through this worship, then, we have a universe united with God but the creatures, as I'm saying, retain their individual identity. This is the original creation. This is sort of Eden. This is, if you like, the Maximus version of, of Eden. But man abused the great gifts that God had given him in preferring his own will to God's. Original sin, this preference, I mean, original sin really means preferring oneself to God. And this appears to have destroyed God's plan for man and indeed for the universe, since, so to speak, that depends on man being willing to be the mediator between God and the universe. And if man prefers himself to anything else, then, you know, he becomes opaque. Nothing can work through him. Um, the universe depends on man and was created for him. So when Adam fell, creation came down with him. So according to this passage, the effects of this original, if you like, perversion, this original turning away, it, it's that sense of you know, turning one's back on God. Um, the effects of this original turning away are still with us. We can only be stopped in our, 
headlong plunge into non-being by suffering. In other words, suffering wakes us up. It, it sort of makes us aware that something is wrong. Suffering, so to speak, is the nervous system of the spirit. Um, it alerts the spirit to the fact that something is not right. Um, through suffering alone can we regain the capacity to love God. Later on, Maximus will say that an easy life is one of the greatest of temptations. And actually, a lot of Maximus' writing is very ascetical in character. And it originates in this idea that um, this is our wake-up call, so to speak, um, and we have to pay attention to it. Of course, this emphasis on self-discipline and ascesis is, is typically monastic, and he was a monk. Um, another consequence of the fall um, is sexual division. According to Maximus, there are five great divisions in creation. So there's the uncreated and the created. You know, God and the universe as a whole. The universe, then, is divided into intelligible being and sensible being. Uh, sensible being is divided into heaven and earth. Paradise uh, and the inhabited world. So, the, sorry, the earth, then, originally was paradise, which was now sealed off to man, and the rest of the world, which man now inhabits, and then finally, male and female. Uh, th th now, this is a very different view of sexual division mm -hmm. from what we find in Augustine, and which is, has remained, in a sense, the typical Western understanding. Each of these divisions represents an aspect of God's unfolding of creation, with the exception of the final one, into masculine and feminine. Um, masculine and feminine, is created by God, and therefore it's good, but it's not what was originally intended. It's kind of a remedy, you know, it's, it's sort of the medicine God brought in when you couldn't do what he originally intended uh, for a man. Maximus tells us that this second differentiation clearly depends in no way on the primordial reason behind the divine purpose concerning human generation. And here he's following Gregory of Nyssa, who maintains that the body originally intended for humanity was not the current one, the one that we now have, but something infinitely more subtle and more powerful. It's almost like this idea of, of matter that is intelligible. Well, that's kind of Neoplatonic technicality. But, you know, there's, there's this um, sense that, you know, the body could have been more powerful, more subtle, you know, sort of less plotish, so to speak, than it is now. Um, it's the human turning away from God that makes the body material and mortal. This is not inherently evil, but uh, as I say, it, it's medicinal. So in that sense, it's, it's a fruit of, of evil. And this also results in a different mode of reproduction than that originally envisaged. Now, Maximus doesn't go into details as to what that might have been, who knows what might have been, but he says it was akin to that of the angels, which is delicate. Um, it is because of the degradation of the body that man has adopted a mode of reproduction similar to that of the lower animals. Now, the higher divisions in being overcome retain their own identity, whereas in this scheme of thought, masculinity or femininity, being consequence of the fall, are not retained. Um, Maximus here is basing himself on um, this line of St. Paul's, um, in Christ there is neither male nor female. Um, that is something which, you know, in, in the eschaton is actually overcome for him. So humanity then, following the fall, is mortal, weak, naturally turned away from God and inclined towards evil. The original thrust, this is kind of dynamism, um, this movement towards final unity with God, seems to have been completely perverted. This, so to speak, um, central knot, this central focus of the universe, which was meant to link all elements of it in a unity of charity, has come apart. It's turned away from its original purpose, and therefore it's lost this capacity to unify. Um, so the universe as a whole, then, is drifting apart. 
But God can still respond to, to this hopeless state of affairs and redeem it. And it is upon this response that Maximus in these passages is commenting. Gregory of Nyssa in a, another homily 200 years before Maximus had said, it's a homily on Christmas, it's actually part of the Christmas readings in, in some areas of the divine office. Natures are instituted afresh and God becomes man. So this is Gregory. Um, Natures are instituted afresh and God becomes man with the incarnation, with Christmas. Um, and this is a reference, as I'm saying, to the incarnation. So Maximus tells us, since then the human person has abused the natural power of uniting what is divided so as to separate what is united. Therefore, in the incarnation, natures have been instituted afresh. In a paradoxical way, something beyond nature has come to sort of refresh and repristinate, created nature. That which is completely unmoved by nature is moved immovably around that which by nature is moved and God becomes a human being. There's a great fondness for, you know, sort of setting up these paradoxes in relation to Christmas because they want to emphasize all the time the extraordinary nature of the incarnation, how it comes into creation without in any way perverting creation and yet is beyond creation. So th th there's a paradox that, that they like to play on in these texts. Through himself, he has, in accordance with nature, united the fragments of the uni universal nature of everything, manifesting the universal logoi blueprints that have come forth for the particulars by which the union of the divided naturally comes about, and thus he fulfills the great purpose of God the Father to recapitulate everything both in heaven and on earth in himself. This is from Ephesians, in whom everything has been created. So, like these Pauline ideas of, you know, the whole creation somehow looking to the incarnation to, to rediscover itself um, are being brought out here. And, and this is actually a strong theme in, in a great deal of early Christian writing. I mean, you have all of these monastic stories about, you know, the animals uh, kind of existing in the monastery grounds as though in Eden. And these are really a way of, a, a sort of anecdotal way of presenting the same idea that somehow with the incarnation, creation is remade and um, as it were, Eden is re-established. That unity of purpose in the whole of creation is re-established. So through the incarnation and only through the incarnation, human nature regains the function it was intended to have in the universe. Now, um, in another text, he, work, he analyzes in detail the actual working out of redemption. On his own, man is justly condemned to pain and mortality. Um, on account of the earthly pleasures, he preferred to God, but God, by taking on human nature, and in particular by taking on the pain and the mortality of the punishment of human nature, without deserving it, I mean, it's this sense of the spotless lamb, the innocent um, victim, undoes the just sentence because a just man suffers an unjust punishment. Human nature, in which he suffers it, is released from this sentence and can once more hope to be what it was created to be. And as I say, this analysis of Christ's understanding of pain and mortality is the foundation also of Maximus' asceticism. Each individual Christian is bound to immerse himself in Christ and to be prepared to share in his suffering in order to share in his triumph. This ultimate deification, which is the original goal of humanity, can only come about now, after all of this has happened, following a life of deliberately chosen virtue and ascetic practice. There's always going to be this struggle within the human will to choose what is good for Maximus. Uh, it, it has to be very deliberate, very chosen. Okay, um, so Christ is there for both the redemption and the fulfillment of human nature. The plan that God conceived for humanity, sent awry by Adam, is restored by Christ's free consent to the Father's will. So as far as Maximus is concerned, when we talk about human nature, 
Ultimately, we mean Christ, since it is Christ who has, as man, most perfectly achieved the fulfillment of human nature. Humanity is everything it can be in Christ. So anthropology then and Christology are very close in Maximus. The anthropology ultimately depends on the Christology. It's also interesting to note, well, again, this is a technical point, um, many of the Eastern Fathers will say that we never know God directly. We always know him through some kind of manifestation. We never actually know him directly. Maximus says we do know him directly. Um, we know him in Christ, who is God. Um, so, you know, we see there then a break with the Hellenistic philosophical tradition. Um, we no longer need all of these layers of manifestation. Because of Christ, we can know God directly, so to speak. We can cut through um, the, the pre-existing structure. Arugina first encountered Maximus following the recommendation of the papal librarian at the time, Anastasius Bibliothecarius, that he study the Greek glossus on these works that I was talking about of Pseudo Dionysius, Dionysius the Areopagite. Uh, glossus that were then thought to be by Maximus, and he found that they helped him enormously. They, they clarified the thought for him. So he went looking for other works of Maximus then um, in order to, to deepen his own thought. His enthusiasm for Maximus' thought is evident in the Periphysian, this book on nature, which is structured according to the divisions in Maximus' thought. So the Periphysian, you know, you have five books in the Periphysian, and he's trying to follow um, the, the divisions that Maximus makes in um, the, the nature of, of the universe. Erudina takes Maximus' anthropology on board wholesale in particular the emphasis on man's creation as the microcosm and the conception of man as the mediator. Maximus' structuring of reality and of human nature are fundamental to Arugina's anthropology. Other aspects of Maximus' thought are less evident, in particular the emphasis on asceticism. Um, however, in fairness to Arugina, that emphasis isn't as present in the texts to which he had access. Um, it's, but as I said at the beginning of the paper, Christian is not that interested in asceticism anyway. Um, you know, he, he really prefers uh, the philosophy. The first mention that Arugina makes of Maximus in regard to human nature is in Book One of the Periphysion, and it concerns the nature uh, of theophany. Theophany is, so to speak, the, the manifestation of God. Um, God is known. Anything that reveals God is a theophany. So, for example, when Moses saw the burning bush, the burning bush is a theophany. Um, Maximus says that this manifestation of God occurs when the compassion of Christ descends into human nature which is simultaneously exalted by love of and desire for God. The theophany, the experience of God, incurs, occurs in this encounter. So God reaches down and man reaches up and in the encounter we have the experience. And this is a reference to um, Ambiguum 10. The first really substantial chunk of Maximus' doctrine comes in Book 2 of the Periphysion, where he's talking about the five divisions of the substance of all things. And he goes straight to the heart of the matter in his commentary. For man was created with a nature of so high a status that there is no creature, whether visible or intelligible, that cannot be found in him. For he is composed of the two universal parts of created nature by way of a wonderful union. For he is the conjunction of the sensible and the intelligible, that is, the extremities of all creation. For in nature there is nothing lower than the body and nothing more exalted than the intellect. As St. Augustine testifies in his book, De Vera Religione, the division of all substances reaches its final goal, its final term in human nature. Notice the attempt to synthesize with Augustine. He wants the Eastern and the Western traditions to be saying the same thing. Like, as you read through Erudrina, um, you'll notice that occasionally he's forced to admit 
that they say something different. And then, so to speak, he cedes to the authority, then thought to be apostolic, of Dionysius the Areopagite. Um, but uh, like there, there is this sort of fantastic attempt to synthesize going on all the way through his work because he realizes that, as I've been saying, the church must breathe with both lungs, that you know, this Eastern thought has something to offer the West which it doesn't have, um, but that also the West must have intimations of this, it must have it in some other form, if Christian thought is to be true at all. You cannot have two churches, both claiming apostolic authority, both having apostolic authority, in fact, completely contradicting each other. Um, and, I, you know, this actually is something that, you know, John Paul was thinking as well, that um, we have two ancient traditions, both of which go back to the, the apostles, which in a sense have been inclined to dismiss each other theologically down through the centuries. And this has meant that each has missed um, insights, if you like, that the other had. However, when we compare them, and when we notice that they're different, we can't completely say that, well, one must be right and the other would be wrong. Um, there must be some common sort of Christian soil out of which they emerge. Um, and, you know, this, this is something that, that uh, is strongly present in Erugina. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sort of skip um, a lot of what I have here. Um, I'm just going on to, to talk about a difference, uh, like a fairly strong difference between Erugina and Maximus. Um, I think it's uh, quotation number nine on your handout. Um, this is in this book on nature, it's Periphyseon. He quotes something that interests him enormously. Um, essentially, it's a passage where he says that God is, is approached, is best approached through intellect. And he bases this on a particular translation of Dionysius. Now, this translation, although it's not completely wrong, it does have a very particular emphasis on knowledge. If, I mean, it's a huge quotation, but if you look about five lines down, um, there's just a saying, he says, he says that man will have agnostic science equal to that of the angels. So he seems to say that the unification of natural substances is in the intellect alone, not in things, but, but in their Gnostic substance, you know, in, in, in what they are intellectually, how they're, they, how they're known. So there's an emphasis on knowledge. He has constructed his translation so as to make it appear that knowledge is the crucial thing. But his, his translation of Dionysius is actually incorrect. Um, the manuscript from which he translated doesn't have Greek accents. So, and at times the accents make a, a crucial difference in meaning. So he reads his line here as making being identical with divine knowledge rather than following on from it. And this emphasis on knowledge strengthens a certain kind of originistic tendency in Erugina's thought, something for which he's often been criticised. When he comes to deal with the Incarnation, he treats of Christ as a second exemplar of man to a far greater extent than as the redeemer of mankind. The redemption almost gets lost in this idea of a sort of a second Adam. Um, his sense of the damage done by the fall is not as acute as Maximus, nowhere near as acute as Maximus. And indeed, he sees human nature as, in essence, untouched by the fall. Man's sin, for a routine, is not so much a malicious turning away from God, but a mere deception which doesn't actually inherently affect his nature. Um, so it doesn't get such a thorough condemnation. So he doesn't have that sense of urgency in dealing with the Incarnation. He doesn't have the sense that 
we really need redemption in that same way. Um, so Christ is an exemplar of man, and that's fine. Christ certainly is the exemplar for Maximus also. He's man perfected and the logos of human perfection. Um, but Erudinus' sense, and this is the difference, Erudinus' sense of human free will, of the tragic possibility of the refusal of God, is not strong. Um, he has a tendency towards monism and towards you know, a universal salvation. Maximus is extremely sensitive to questions involving human will. The redemption of man is brought about by Christ's perfect assent as man to the will of the Father. In the perfect submission of his own will to that of the Father, Christ undoes the work of Adam, who preferred his own will to God's. Human beings are still willful and self-absorbed. Each individual has to go through this kind of painful process of submission for himself, and this is a struggle. But the result of it is the glory won for us by Christ. But for Erudina, the struggle is not uh, will, it's not a struggle of will in the same way. It's an intellectual struggle. It's a struggle to know and to learn. So the struggle with the passions is not felt in the same way. Um, so for Erudina then, um, the fall simply consisted in not knowing what was going on. So in that sense, nothing terribly bad happened. Um, one cannot be held accountable for an error in judgment about the possibility of which one was not warned. And that impacts on human freedom. And in doing away with human freedom, it does away with any importance whatsoever of the individual. Um, since people will do what they are destined to do anyway. So deification becomes a matter of knowledge. But again, in fairness, it's a subtle difference because for Maximus, deification also involves knowledge. But Maximus has this emphasis on the practical life, on the leading of a good life. Um, and it's through this leading of the good life that the mind is made capable of contemplation. Um, so you can't know for Maximus unless you're leading a good life. And this is a strong monastic theme, in fact. It's also a strong theme in certain schools of Hellenistic philosophy. Philosophy is a way of life that needs to the knowledge of the divine. Without the way of life, you can't get the knowledge of the divine. It's not purely an analytic type of knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, when we talk about knowledge in relation to Erudina, in fairness to him, we should attribute to him some of that sense of knowledge as something that involves the whole person. It involves a way of life as well as simply a kind of an analytic, if you like, brain understanding of things. Um, so then when we come to the whole question of what became of Arugina, it's clear from the Paraphysium that Erudina intended enriching the philosophical and theological life of the Western Church with the ideas which we had found so stimulating in the great Byzantine thinkers. But this was not going to happen for a variety of reasons. Initially, his work was well received. Uh, we find in the 11th century, sort of 10th and 11th centuries, we find lots of citations of Erudina. There's an important text uh, by a man called Honorius Augustin, Augustu Donensis, which is, if you like, a, a resume of the Paraphysion. And that enjoyed a fairly wide circulation. It, it gets into, for example, uh, Bonaventure's works, and Bonaventure seems to have known it. But Erudina himself, um, after his sort of 11th and 12th century flourishing, um, fell into disrepute. Um, in the 12th century in particular, Erudinian thought enjoyed something of a renaissance, above all at the Cathedral School of Chartres, where his Platonic cosmology was of interest to people such as Bernard of Chartres. In Paris, his translation of the Corpus Dionysiacum, accompanied by you know, footnotes uh, drawn from his philosophical works, played a very important part in the school of St. Victor. Um, the Paraphysion, as I'm saying, was excerpted as part of a standard gloss on the corpus. Um, and this was read as a couvent Saint-Jacques. Um, it, it was also read by the Franciscans. So in sort of back doorways, his thought gets into the Western tradition. 
However, um, his prestige changed drastically during the 13th century. Why? Well, it was always known that he was a difficult author. Um, in 1210, he was condemned in the most unambiguous terms, along with two writers called David of Dinon and Amalric of Ben or Chart. He was also Chart. A condemnation which was reiterated again in 1225, again in 1681 upon the publication of Thomas Gale's first edition, uh, first printed edition of his works. Uh, in 1681, when this was uh, produced, the Periphysion was promptly placed on the index. Um, and what was being condemned here was essentially pantheism. David is accused of it, and so is Amalric. And the claim has lingered. Why was he accused of pantheism? Essentially because this cosmology which I've outlined in Maximus Confessor and which is kind of reiterated in the Periphysion was very strange to Western ears at that time. Um, what they failed to pick up in Erugena was the strength of his negative theology. Erugena says, you can never know God as he is in himself. And therefore, um, even if we say that the universe participates in God, you know, the universe is unified in God, we're not identifying the universe with God. Things do retain their individual natures um, and they remain distinct. But Erugena's followers, in particular these two, David of Dinon and Amalric of Ben, um, left out the negative theology. Um, the Maximian cosmology, which Erugena attempted to reproduce, seemed um, in 1210 to be stating that the universe is God. Now, we know that Erugena intended to reproduce the Maximian Christological cosmology for the benefit of the Western Church. And given his own very strong emphasis on negative theology, pantheism in the strict sense is not characteristic of his work at all. However, it does seem to have been characteristic of the other two. Um, the instruction to destroy their works was carried out rather thoroughly. So it's difficult to know for certain what they wrote. Um, there is a discussion by Albert the Great of the case of David of Dinon. And what emerges from that is that the other guy, Amalric, was influenced by Erugena. And that Erugena's condemnation came about partly as a result of this stated influence. Um, but in fact, Amalric main inspiration was not really Erugena, but it was actually Joachim of Fiore and his antinomian sense of the Holy Spirit as sort of speak, releasing us from all rules. There is a clear connection though to Amalric because he does mention Erugena as being one of these people who, you know, like Joachim, um, believed that uh, in the third age, the age of the Holy Spirit, um, all was unified and you know, there was no more need for struggle. With David of Dinon, the situation is a good deal more puzzling. The citations we find in Albert the Great demonstrate no original influence whatsoever. They're not even Neoplatonic. David of Dinon is reading Aristotle. He's a dialectician in the Aristotelian sense. He's far closer to Peter Abelard than to Erugena. He's a thoroughgoing materialist. Anything further from what's often called Erugena's objective idealism would be hard to find. What finally emerges regarding David is that he has been reading the early books of Aristotle's metaphysics and that he has taken on board this pre-Socratic belief in the unity of the cosmos in a material sense, um, wholesale. Um, it's this very primitive notion, immanentist and materialist, that you know, everything is unified by being matter. And as I say, anything further from this Maximian cosmology that Erugena is trying to reproduce would be hard to find. So the condemnation of David then marks one stage in the battle 
which actually raged around the works of Aristotle, and this is why Albert the Great is interested in him. Um, Albert is essentially saying David doesn't understand Aristotle, um, and therefore you shouldn't condemn Aristotle because David is an idiot. Now, the same thing could have been said for Eugenia. Um, Aristotle did not deserve to be excluded from the universities on account of David's misunderstanding. The quarrel had nothing whatsoever to do with Maximus cosmology as presented by Eugenia. There was some idea of unity underpinning both Rutina was sort of guilty by association there. It's interesting to reflect on the association of ideas which lies behind this condemnation. However, the net result is that an intelligent attempt and a rather comprehensive attempt to understand and represent the thought of the Greek East was almost definitively lost. Now, as I've been saying, as I've been highlighting, Eruginus' understanding of Maximus is not perfect. There are things that he misses, and some of the things that he misses are rather important. Um, there are problems with his thinking, but they're not the problems for which he was condemned. Um, only a very select few um, ever read or understood Eruginus. In the 15th century, for example, Nicholas of Cusa um, sort of gets beyond, if you like, the bad odour uh, which surrounded him. For the most part, he's kind of concealed in this dust cloud of, of controversy and polemic. This becomes especially acute after the Reformation, um, because in the sort of Anglican and Church of Ireland context, he's enlisted, so to speak, in the attempt to prove that the insular churches, so the Celtic Church and the Anglo-Saxon Church, were never Roman, um, that they were always kind of autonomous. And, you know, uh, as I say, this is why Gale um, at Cambridge produced an edition of his works in 1681. This is why James Usher takes an interest of him, in him in Dublin at around the same time. This is why we have manuscripts of Eruton in Trinity College. Um, and then later, um, in some of the Jansenist controversies uh, surrounding the, the nature of the Eucharist and the whole question of transubstantiation, some works of Retramnus of Corby, wrongly ascribed to Eugenia, on the essentially symbolic nature of the Eucharist, are picked up by, as it were, the, the Jansenist side in the controversy. And again, you know, this, this great philosopher um, you know, doesn't believe in transubstantiation either. In that case, it's a wrong attribution. But, you know, whenever Eugenia is trotted out, it's bad news. Um, it means there's some kind of controversy, some kind of, of problem. And he's generally enlisted on the heterodox side. So, to read his works sympathetically, um, in any kind of orthodox sense, I mean, it, it's really actually only in the last hundred years or so that that has happened. Um, and in a sense, it's, it's work that's ongoing. Um, Eruton is kind of unique in his time in being an original philosopher and being somebody who can actually philosophize, actually work with ideas and actually sort of get to the bottom of things. There are aspects of particularly Augustine, which are problematic and which he picks up on and, and you know, tries to work with and tries to work with in terms of Maximus and Pseudo Dionysius. There are also aspects that are picked up by Aquinas later on. And you know, one of the interesting things is that when we come to the Orthodox Church, insofar as they know the Western tradition, there's a rather different approach. They see Eugenia as being somebody who's very much on the right track. And we also know at this stage that um, Aquinas was read in Byzantium in the 14th century um, and was considered orthodox. So, you know, they view a sort of continu continuity of orthodoxy there, which, um, as I say, because of historical circumstances and controversy, is not really present in the West. But because of this very serious attempt to synthesize, um, because of this very strong sense of a, a sort of a, an essential sort of Christian substrate in, in both theologies, 
I still think it's worthwhile trying to get to grips with uh, erogenous thought. So thank you for your patience. Sorry for keeping it for so long. Thank you.